currently on a transit, the executive committee and the board of trustees. I welcome you all, our teachers, our mentors, our senior colleagues and my colleagues to the NSA 8 webinar series, second session, which is case-based discussion for our candidate going for exam. Thank you for joining us today. And now I would like to hand you over to the Secretary of the Education Committee, Dr. Oranose. Thank you. Dr. Ranuzi. Hello. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, good evening. Good evening, JS participants. Um, we are five minutes past the time, so we have to start. Thank you so much, uh, dear Piero, for uh, your invitation. And um, on behalf of the President and Executive Committee of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists, I want to welcome us all to this second session of the eighth webinar series of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists. So today we'll be engaging in case-based discussions like we've been told already by our residents who are preparing for the examinations. And then they'll be guided by our ABLE uh, facilitators who will be introduced by the moderator for the day. And our moderator for today is none other than Dr. Abdullahi Alfa. He's a consultant anesthetist at the Department of Anesthesia, Amino Kanu Teaching Hospital, Kanu, Kanu State. And um, uh, he is going to be guiding us uh, throughout the uh, uh, duration of the webinar. Our webinar is expected to last not more than 90 minutes. And so we are going to uh, manage our time to ensure that we finish up within the given time. So allow me to welcome Dr. Abdullahi Alfa to have the floor. Dr. Alfa, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oranisi, for that brief uh, introduction. As uh, it has been said, today we will be in the, uh, the eighth webinar series, second session, case-based discussion organized by the society, about the Nigeria Society of Anesthetists. Um, I want to briefly thank the, I want to briefly thank, thank Mr. Uh, Mrs. President, Madam President Rada, and the ESCO of the Nigeria Society of Anesthetists. And then the chairman of the education committee, and the secretary and other members of the education committee for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session. Actually, this session is a very important session because it's, it's not, um, it prepares our candidates who are going for, for various exams for both colleges and to assess them and prepare them for the exams and for them to be successful in their exams. Not only that, this is also, this also provides, um, it provides rather a, a platform for continued education to update our knowledge as an anesthetist. Without, without further ado, I would like to introduce the facilitators of today case based discussion i would like to call on dr oham m felix from the federal ecosota anesthetist and the head department of anesthesia and intensive care federal university hospital oweri imo state sir you are welcome to the webinar you're welcome, sir. Dr. Holm, are you, are, you, are, you, are, you on, are you on the floor? Are you on the floor? On the floor, rather. So I will introduce the second um, facilitator. He's a consultant anesthetist 
with Zenith Medical and Kidney Center, Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. His name is Dr. Olatu Bosun. Oh, Ogunyomi. Yeah, thank you. Have you said that? Oh. Dr. Olatu Bosun? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, welcome, sir. Yeah. Oh. Then I also want to welcome the participants to this um, webinar. As the ground rule, a question will be asked by any of the facilitator, whereby a candidate will be picked, or a participant rather will be picked, to respond to the question. Both the candidate's response, then the facilitator contribution will be done within 10 minutes. So you are advised to stick to the time. Then any participant that wants to contribute will do so by raising his hand or her hand or by writing on the chat board. So with this brief introduction, I would like to call on the I would like to call on Dr. Olatumbosu Ogunyomi or Ogunyomi from a consultant anesthetist at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center, Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. The floor is open for you, sir. Yeah, thank you. It's all right. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Olawanle Olatumbosu Ogunyomi, one of the facilitators for today's webinar. It's a great honor to be given this opportunity to participate in this webinar. So without waiting much time again, I'd like to start with the first question. The question goes as follows. A five-day-old neonate is scheduled for tracheal esophageal fistula repair. Next part of the question is to discuss the perioperative management of this patient that's scheduled for five that's scheduled for track track esophageal fistula repair. That's, let me come over again. A five-day-old neonate is scheduled for track esophageal fistula repair. Discuss the perioperative management of this patient. The second part. What are the intraoperative challenges? Do we get the question right? Hello. Hello, Doctor Doctor Guyomi. Um, you you may have to um call up on the particular um, candidate so that the person will take the question. Thank you. You have to call the person out. Hello. 
But I don't, we can hear you. We, we can hear you now. Yes. Dr. Abiy George, are you here? If Dr. Abiy George is not with us, let Dr. Azuka respond to the question. Eh? Dr. Azuka Godwin. Hello, Dr. Azuka Godwin. Can you respond to the question? For the second person, okay, Doctor Lawa Rahim. Doctor Lawa Rahim, are you here with us? If you are here with us, can you respond to the question? Please, can the candidates just raise up their hand so that we will pick from those who are here? Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Sir. Lawal is here. Okay, yeah, Dr. Lawal Rahim. Yes, sir. Yeah, kindly respond to the question. Okay, I sir. The que I yeah, uh, the question if I'm, I think I'm right. Is. Five day hold new need plan for tracking to Fuji is like mm -hmm. The question now says discuss the preoperative management of the patients. Why the B plus say what are the interoperative challenges of the patients? Exactly. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. For this particular patient, to tackle this patient, I have to base my A plus discussion on preoperative management, interoperative management, and the post operative management. As part of the preoperative management of this newness, the same plan for I need to know the feeding pattern of this particular patient. Other this particular feeding, I need to know after taking in the breast milk, any history of vomiting, especially any vomiting, I need to know because in this particular patient, we expect the patient since there's a fistula, the whatever the patient is taking in won't be able to go down to the GIT. I need to find out about that one. Also, I will need to find out the history of cough or difficulty in breathing this patient because as a result of the communication between the GIT and the trachea, we expect some of this feed to go into the trachea, which as a result, we impact the food respiration of this particular neuron. After knowing this one, I need to know maybe there is a history of fever because the, the, the condition can be complicated by Upper respiratory tract infection. Also, I will also to know to know maybe if there is any history of bluish of the baby, because this one will also tell us the, how complicated, how severe the condition has been in this particular patient. Also, on getting to know all this particular one now, I think I have to do because of this recurrent vomiting, salivation, excessive salivation. I have to, the patient may likely be dehydrated. And under my physical examination, I have to see the degree of the dehydration in this particular patient. Because in this particular patient, the history of the fluid management as part of the preoperative preparation of this patient is very key, because as we all know. Also, as part of to make the confirmation of this particular, I have to pass the NG2, either to decompress whatever that is in upper GIT, or to confirm my diagnosis. After doing all this one, I will have to request from some examination, which include full blood count, to rule out maybe that is the PCV of this patient, the WBC to rule out of any ongoing upper respiratory tract infection. After confirming this thing, I will have also need to ask for the chest, the chest history, both the anterior view and lateral view to rule out to confirm the diagnosis. After doing this thing, in taking the patient part of the pre-op management, as well as the and this particular patient need to be on intra what's it, on fluid since the patient cannot take orally. 
the fluid management in this patient pre op and inter op is very key. Also, I have to put this patient on we continue the pre op antibiotics. Also, during the intraoperative management of this particular patient, the airway management is very key since the, this particular patient is a, is a case of difficult intubation and oxygenation. The airway management in this patient is very key. Also, also intraoperative management of this patient, since this patient is a new need, we must make sure we ensure the thermoneutral intraoperative environment. Hello. I hear you. I'm with you. Okay, sir. Also, as part of the intraoperative, the oxygenation on in the on the operation table after okay after intubating the patient, the oxygenation of this patient is very key, as we all know that this patient, this particular patient, may have problem with the oxygenator, oxygenation and ventilation. We have to prepare for that particular. And part of the post-op management, we make sure we continue with the fluid and pain management is also key in this particular patient. Uh, be the B part, okay, what are the, okay. The B part of the patient said, what are the intraoperative challenges? As I said in the A part, the, most challenging in managing this particular patient is the intubation and oxygenation of this patient. That means we have to prepare for the difficult airway tray managing this particular patient and to oxygen. Also, among the challenges we may have concerning this patient is the fluid management. Being a new need, the fluid management is very key as the fluid needs to be given as per the weight of the patient using the 421 the one regimen to calculate, to determine the weight of the patient and to give the fluid in trapezoid. Also, we should not also forget about the pain management too, because it's an extensive surgery and this patient is a new nurse. Because it's not new, we not, should not forget about the importance of giving the intra of analgesia using the short tapping and short tapping analgesia. Something, something like fentanyl. So. Dr. Lawrence. Yeah. Sir. You have, okay, you have so about seven minutes. You have three more minutes. Continue. Also, as part of the interoperative challenges that we may have, as we know, the the new needs, they are they are prone to okay. So they are prone to hypothermia. We have to ensure the thermoneutral environment, the fluid intake, we have to be optimal by using the 421 method in giving them the fluid. Also, we analgesia of mentioned, and also the blood loss in this particular patient. And we should not allow the excessive blood loss. And if there is the blood loss in this patient, more than 10% allowable blood loss, the patient should be transfused volume for volume. Are you done? Yes, sir. Okay. It's been like eight minutes. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Adlai. Yes, Hello, sir. Please, I want to ask for something. What I don't know if it's possible, though, you know, as we have clarified this before. Like okay, in sir. this case, it's possible to allow more than one uh, participant to respond to the question. Mm, okay, I wasn't told about that, but um, so far, the aim of this is for them to really understand. Yeah. So I think maybe we may give room for that. If there's any, okay. I know, maybe 
that one we spend like um three or, or five minutes. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Mm. So if there's any candidate or any is there any candidate or any any participant that is readily willing to also contribute to to respond? Should I just select someone? Dr. Charles Mwogu. Are you here with us? Dr. Charles Mwogu. Yes, I'm here. I just joined that. Uh, okay, you didn't hear the question. Okay, let me yes, just read out for you that a five day old neonate is booked for tracheal osophagia fistula repair. This cost very operative management of this patient. B part, what are the intraoperative challenges? Okay, thank you, sir. The five days old unit is uh, built for um, Takios the Jeff Fistula um, for fistula repair. Um, the management of this patient will be divided into pre-operatively, pre-operative in, uh, management, intra and post-operative management. Um, the Takios the Jeff Fistula chart were present with uh, signs of um, choking, coughing, and cyanosis as a result of the <coughs> um, choking from the secretions from the pouch, the blind osophagia pouch, which uh, comes and contaminates the predisposed child to choking. And sometimes the parents <coughs> may commence feeding without knowing that the child has a pathology. So the risk of aspiration and chest infection is there. Um, so they present with uh, choking, coughing, and the cyanosis. So in the intraoperative intro period, as we are seeing this child in the... Hello, sir. Well, yes. You know, what we want you to say is that if there's any addition, the first um, presenter had already told us some of those things. You have mentioned. I, I didn't listen to him from the beginning, so I don't know where... Okay, okay. Okay, go on, go on, go on. Go on, go ahead. Okay, let me make it let me make it somehow faster. Um mm -hmm. so um, we will be able to manage the chest infection in the distance, and then we should be able to pass a, a repluged tube to be able to prevent this from occurring from the time we are reviewing. This child may also come with, down with dehydration, um, maybe septic, and uh, so in the preoperative period, this child will be managed. Um, the infection treated, um, the hydration corrected uh, in the preoperative period. And um, a little bit of other um, examination to check for other associations, because it's a, it can come with other, other bacteria associations. The, so we examine the vertebra and other, this in particularly in particular of interest is the, cardio, uh, the uh, cardiac congenital anomaly, something like, something like a, a VSD. So um, we obtain informed consent for the parents and uh, do um, the fasting guideline while we are ensuring that this child is the rehydration continues in the preoperative period. Then we cancel the patient on general anesthesia and the trachea intubation. Before this child arrives in theater, um, we ensure that there's a terminal environment, though he said that um, the induction of this, uh, the, the, the induction is very technical and Attention, detailed attention should be paid to it. Um, um, this child will be um, in the in the interoperative after, after ensuring the monitoring environment, ensuring that our airway equipments are all set and the anesthesia machines checked and the resuscitation drugs and resuscitation equipments checked. The child will be um, for me. I will prepare to do an induction and an intravenous induction um, to prevent the chances of um, inhalation and induction and probably doing a IPPV before securing the airway and insufflating the stomach. So I will do an intravenous induction and uh, realization with substance metronium then. While passing the tube, in the presence of a bronchoscope, that's the ideal uh, equipment to use. But in the absence of a bronchoscope, the tube should be passed down and to, up to the carina when you meet a little bit of the resistance. And then you pull back a little while you auscultate the lungs and uh, auscultate the stomach to be sure that the point where the distal uh, part of the osphago connects to the trachea is actually occluded to reduce the risk of the gastric contents contaminating the airway. Um, 
post-operative uh, uh, complications, just like he said, it's a neonate um, apnea. It's a, an important consideration. So in the preoperative period, we should ensure that the, um, the uh, part of the post pain, pain management should be um, field, um, field block, that is infiltration of the surgical site to be able to reduce the need for opioid-based uh, medications which predisposes the students to respiratory depression and apnea. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Well done, Dr. Rahim and Dr. Jasmogo. Uh, so it's time to make some correction to what people have said as regards the management of this case. Yeah. From onset, we ask this kind of question, at least try to let the examiner know that you know what the procedure is even all about. About the epidemiology, there are different type of tachycardia fistula. The commonest type, which is type C, that we know the one that people are really talking and describing, you need to state it in your introduction. And also, there, that's why you mentioned all those classical symptoms and signs with which the patient normally presents with. Yeah, as regards the pre operative management, we did so well. But the area that the Dr. Uh, uh, Rohim missed in the first place, the, how do you even do the, make the diagnosis? The fact that, okay, that the surgeon has made diagnosis that the, what we have is this jacobacter fistula. Passing an NG tube that it used to go beyond, let's say testing me or just calling that doesn't go again. Now, I have this what chest x ray. What is it on chest x ray? You can be in this school, starting the diagnosis. So now come to the preoperative management. You both mentioned a lot as regards what and what needs to be done. But one key that you for you could be in you know, okay, this patient that is not feeding MPO, name power. Okay, Dr. Ongu, you said okay that to prescribe a uh, fasting guideline. The patient is already fasting. It's, it's, it's meant to be on a power. So nothing like you prescribing a fasting guideline for the for the patient. Sure you get it's on a power. So I'm there that no problem you need to maintain giving appropriate and adequate food. So securing good intravenous access is paramount in management of this patient. So that's supposed to be well highlighted. And this kind of patient, even your therapeutic period, I do what was the position? You just lie the patient down the on the bed like that. Remember, I said that the, the proximal part of the uh, sofa god that is a, a pouch, the occlusion that is just accumulating there. If the patient just lie down supine or like that on, on the on the bed, the secretion will just draw down and nesting, entering into the airway. So the patient should be not in the bed at prop up. That's also a vital point that it could be mentioned there. Then the antibiotic coverage for possible or likelihood of chest infection that are likely to, 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 to happen in this kind of patient. Most commonly, ampicillin based, or you use, we use a third generation cephalosporin to have a wider coverage. Then there is another area point that is in the problem manual that is not mentioned that is somehow key. The, Gastric distension, the effects on his own, and then also the aspiration that might come from gastric content that are not entered to the airway through the fistula. In some cases, gastrostomy too is usually placed under local infiltration before the surgery. So, with that, the gastric content will be aspirated out and then 
any air coming from the white breathing will be also just let the, the gastrostomy to open. Now, the intraoperative management, are you the key thing to the induction, intubation, and maintenance of the patient is very key, which both of you really mentioned there. Eh? Another thing is now, how do you carry out this induction of anesthesia for this patient and the position the patient is going to be for the surgery? You might have not been an opportunity to see to witness this case, but being only being left lateral degree of the course. Most likely is that the patient is a uh, the 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 site where the surgeon falls from is left to the cotony. Though this the minimal invasive is being done, but classical approach is classical surgery is the open to which is on the right. Then now, now that reminds me, in part of the intervention that needs to be done preoperative is your is echocardiogram. Because in some cases there as Dr. Oh, I would really mention eh, the vector association that in which uh, the vaginal fistula is among eh, can happen that the cardiac kind of abnormality, the aortic arc that's mostly on the that's supposed to be on the on the on the on the on the on the left can be on the right. So in that case, there will be no access for the surgeon to operate um, from the right side. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. I know we have exhausted so much time on this question. Okay. So thank you very much. So for that conclusion for many other from the other participants. Thank you, sir. I think we've done justice to this uh, particular question. If not, we may not be able to take uh, many questions. Already this to six. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually, for each question, both yeah. the re about the response from the discussant, and then contribution from the facilitator, supposed to last within ten minutes. That's what. Uh, that's what. That's it, that's, that's the timing. But okay. already we have uh, we've, we've spent about 30 minutes on this. Okay, yeah, I agree with you, sir. Let's go to the second question. Let's go to the second question. Yes. Thank you, Mama, sir. Yeah. Second question of state says is only kidding this is patient with stage four renal failure present for kidney transplantation. Question A. What are the organ effects that must be considered in this patient? B, what are the possible post-operative complications and management? Let me come back again. A chronic kidney disease patient, stage four, present for kidney transplantation. A, what are the organ effects that must be considered in this patient. B, what are the possi possible post-operative complications and the management? I hope you hear me clearly. So I would like uh, Dr. Agduk, if you are here with us to attempt this question. Dr. Agduk. Are you here with us? Dr. Agduk. Okay. Dr. Daat Salau. Dr. Daat Salau. Dr. Danat Asalawi is not, um, he's just a participant. Okay. Uh, he's from our center. He's, uh, okay, okay. He's uh, so just a participant. So, Akani here, Bernard, can you attend the question? Dr. Akani here, Bernard.
ओके बेलो थैंक यू सर आई मोस्टली प्रोवाइड आई टी सपोर्ट थैंक यू ओके तो खता हूँ गुड इवनिंग सर वेलकम थैंक यू Prof. Dr. Odu Kuye Ruke Ruke Ve. Is there any participants? Dr. Odu Kuye. Hello. Sorry, I'm Hello. um I'm also supervising. I'm a fellow. Okay. Okay. Ah, <laughs> sorry, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Well, well, I, I need volunteer. Okay. The list of okay here. Any volunteer? Yes. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Go on. Yeah. Well, my name is Doctor Uba. Please, sir, uh, I don't um understand the first part of the question very well. Okay, um, okay. Did you say what are the organ system effects that must be considered in this patient? Yes, okay, sir. Um, a chronic kidney um, disease patient for kidney transplant. So, um, the in the central nervous system, the patient can have um uremic encephalopathy. Um, which um we must. Put into um, consideration, okay. and um, also avoid um, worsening of the patient's condition. Um, then um, the person in the gastrointestinal system, the patient can have um, uremic gastritis and um, upper GI bleeding. Okay. So we we need to give um. Um, ulcer prophylaxis to this patient. <clears throat> then, um, in the hematological system, the patient can have a coagulopathy. Okay. So we need to do a coagulation studies and ensure that um, INR is um, less than 1.5 before surgery. Then the possible postoperative complications. We um, the patient can have um, pulmonary edema from fluid overload. So um, we need to ensure adequate fluid balance um, and avoid fluid overload postoperatively. The patient can have um. Um, sepsis postoperatively because um, CKD patients are immunocompromised. We need to give anti adequate antibiotics um, postoperatively. Okay. Mm -hmm. There could also be worsening of the chronic disease. This patient can have an acute and chronic um, injury. So and we need to take um, into consideration the um, dialysis of the patient, um, the timing of dialysis for the patient, because um, we'll be using um, a lot of medications during the surgery. So the, the patient may require um, post operative um, dialysis. They could also be um reject um the patient could reject the um, transplanted kidney um if there is a um, baby graft um graft versus host disease, um 
graft versus host disease. So um, the patient will need to be on use on suppressive drugs such as um, um steroids post operatively. And okay, sir. Okay. You are done. Um, we spent six minutes on that, so we have four more minutes. Four more minutes. Okay. Um. Maybe so we can ask if there's anybody, if there's another volunteer from the floor. Is there another person that would like to attempt from the floor, please? You can respond. Yes, sir. Okay. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sorry, sir. My name is Dr. Omar Abdullahi. Okay. Okay. Dr. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, the question asks about the organ effect on patient with renal, renal failure. Organ system Sir. effect of let me organ system effect of stage okay. four chronic kidney disease. Okay, sir. So, sir, the stage four chronic kidney disease um can affect almost all the system in the body. So, the effect if you can take it from cardiovascular system, it can affect the patient cardiovascular system in terms of the increased load overload in the patient. And also, um, there's also um, reduced heart rate in the patient from the effect of the uremia and the SA load. There is also, um, so patient can be also hypertensive from either as a cause or a complication of the chronic renal failure. Then for the and all this can affect the anesthetic practice, uh, ranging from the dosing of the drug as well as the um, cardiac reserve to withstand the anesthetic or anesthetic, especially general anesthesia on the patient. Then for the respiratory system, as earlier mentioned, the, uh, from the old fluid overload, the patient can have um, a risk of edema. Also, it can also affect the oxygen carrying capacity of the patient intraoperatively. Then for the hematological system, the patient can be anemic either from the, um, from the effect of the disease, um, either from um, hemolysis by the anemia or from the reduce in the production of the erythropoietin by the condition. Then CNS patient can have <clears throat> um, uremic encephalopathy. Then um, the GI system also patient can have the uremic gastropathy, which can affect the patient. Patient can have regurgitation and aspiration, especially during the induction. Then also the musculoskeletal system also there will be patient can be waste despite there is edema, a patient can be wasted, and this can affect the musculos uh, neuromuscular blocking agent dosing of the patient. In endocrine also, the cause can be either from, can, because of the renal failure can be from the diabetes. So patient can have problem with the glucose metabolism. And also the most important thing is the drug dosing in the patient and handling of the drug by the patient. In patient with chronic renal failure can have effect with the hepatic system as well as the renal system in combination. So both drug metabolism and excretion Therefore, um, for the drug, um, we can use drug that cannot be excreted by the kidney for the patient. Even that one, we can use them in a low dose, or we can use a very low dose drug if the patient, um, if the drug are, uh, should be excreted by the kidney. So, so these are the system that can be affected um, by the renal failure for the A patient. Then for B part of the patient, the post-operative complication also, if we can take them systematically, the patient can have, intraoperative patient can have bleeding, which can, if not managed adequately, patient can have post-operative anemia and 
cardiac uh, symptoms from excessive bleeding that the patient have. Also, the bleeding can also be from either massive that is pushing the patient because the surgery um, um, is a major surgery and also is associated with blood loss. So if patient receive um, um, more than 50% of his uh, total blood, he may have complication of the massive blood transfusion. Then also, um, hypothermia also is a complication because operatively. Then pain also, because of the, the pain on the approach of the, um, so, uh, approach of the, um, uh, the surgical incision, depend on the approach. So it is painful um, procedure. So also uh, pain is a complication for operatively. Then also airway complication for operatively after extubating of the patient. Then patient um, later patient can have also some complications such as infection and then organ rejection. Then patient may require salvage dialysis immediately post operatively or later and their complication. So, so these are the uh, post okay. Yeah. Well done, Dr. Abdullah and Dr. If I don't well. Now, as regarding the, the the A part of the question, the organ system effects of chronic disease on this patient, you attempted very very well, but you try fail to focus mainly on the pathophysiology of the chronic kidney disease. The major issue is one, the kidney not able to perform its function. One major aspect is the electrolyte and fluid balance of the body. So these two key derangements alone is what cause most of the complications that sets in in the organ system of the body. So if you take like respiratory, one of you mentioned pulmonary edema, pleural effusion, which are one of the, that which are the commonest complication or effect that the CKD do have on this patient. Yeah, Dr. Abdullah, you mentioned the cardiovascular hypertension, which may be primary cause at the same time complication or effect of the CKD. Pericarditis, pericarditis is part of the effect too that CKD has from this patient. We didn't mention that. It's chemical disease also is part of the thing that they do come down with. Yeah, we mentioned musculoskeletal. What is the effect in the musculoskeletal? The issue of the electrolytes uh, imbalance that comes with the CKD can ultimately result in uh, something like fracture due to bone demineralization uh, that they experience. What else? So like that, the calcium in the is impaired. So as regards the parts A of the question, those are the areas that we didn't mention specifically, the pericarditis, pulmonary edema, pleural effusion, and to look at the hypertension also as the organ system effects the CKD patient do have. Then possible post-operative complication that this patient do have. Basically, it has to do with now, they are suffering from CKD and they have all these attendant effects in the organ system. Now, patient on the go kidney transplantation, which was meant to correct and start accelerating all these sign of symptoms they're having. But if the transplantation does not work, that's the major complication that we do have, which the, uh, the first participant that I responded mentioned, allograft rejection. If it happens in immediate transplantation, that is a serious problem. Then, under immediate conclusion that we need to mention, that we need to factor in, that we don't really mention is bleeding, so to say. Let's not forget that this patient, they're already on stage four, killing this patient is already on dialysis. So, during dialysis, they do use 
anticoagulant, a print. And preparing them for transplantation, of course, you have to make sure their their creatinine level and the uh, urea come down to a reasonable level before you go on with the transplant. So having dialysis done to correct this, the print the print that's been used during dialysis, some of them are still being the circulation that will impair bleeding. And also the effect of the uremia they are also they do have also cause some sort of coagulopathy. So in the immediate transplantation, one of the conditions that my setting is bleeding. So and how do you manage that? Of course, I I I should also make that as okay, half blood being group and force yeah. matched, half other blood products, platelets, first frozen plasma on ground. Then the second one that I mentioned that the allograft rejection is there. What if that happened? What's the next thing to do? Dr. Avlai mentioned that okay, they need to go back to dialysis. That's how you manage that. Then this patient that have undergo transplant, they are going to be on what immunosuppressant, so they are prone to what infection. So you need to give adequate antibiotic coverage. So that's the basic thing to look at. Thank you very much, Doctor Dr. Bolson. So we can go for the next question. Okay. Yeah, the next question then. Eh? So a 36 year old grand and uh, multiparous woman with multiple gestation is scheduled for elective cesarean session. She is a known asthmatic patient with optimal control. Hello. So the first part of the question is say, what are your concerns for this case? B, what are your anesthetic options? Then C, list five possible complications that may arise and briefly outline management of one of them. Let me come over again. A 36 year old grand multiparous woman mm -hmm. with multiple gestation is scheduled for elective cesarean session. She is a known asthmatic with optimal control. A, what are your concerns? B, what are your anesthetic options? C, list five possible complications that may arise and briefly outline Fragment of one. So, Dr. Ojedoin, if you are here with us, can you attempt? Dr. Ojedoin. Dr. Abiodun Ojedoin. Dr. Abiyodun Ojedoin, are you here with us? Okay. Dr. Mandu Okujungu. Dr. Mandu. What about Dr. Malau Kefas? Doctor, so I think if you if you have called three to five people, then we can ask for any volunteer. Okay. Okay. Good evening, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. Okay. Go on. Okay, I'm Doctor Lainka. Um, question: Um, a grand multiparous, multiple gestation, and asthmatic. Um, my a grand multiparous are at risk of um postpartum hemorrhage. So my first concern is um, the likelihood of postpartum hemorrhage 
Also, she's an asthmatic and although optimally controlled, so but I'll ensure that um, when she's coming to the theater, she comes with her inhaler after I've tried to confirm her triggers, how, we, how does she manage and what, she, what brings about the trigger. So as much as possible, I want to avoid any stamina releasing agent for her. Another concern is difficult airway because of the pregnancy, um, they tend to have uh, their potentially difficult airway patients. Then also she's going to be at risk of um, um she's going to be at risk of um desaturation in case I need to do um a general anesthesia relaxant technique. So that's another consideration. Then also my concern is that um more than two lives are involved, which is the life of the mother, and she's also carrying twin gestation. So as much as possible, I want to ensure that um every um even under anesthesia. She she save for the surgery. Um, another consideration is she's at risk of coagulopathy in case um, there's excessive bleeding. So my anesthetic option will be a options will be a general and a general anesthesia relaxant technique with rapid sequence induction. That's one of the options. Then I will also want to do a just to avoid the hairway. I will want to do um subarachnoid block. But that would depend on the competency of the surgeon. I will ensure that for the type of case, it's going to be an experienced surgeon obstetrician that will be fast about the procedure. And as much as possible, we ensure there are minimal bleeding because they also are, they are, they are also at risk of um, abnormal placement of the placenta, placenta, accreta, increta. Um, so um, I, then also epidural is another option for um, the woman. So my so talking about the post-op complication, number one is postpartum hemorrhage is one of the complications I want to look into. Um, another complication is um, difficulty in difficult airway because of edema based on the um, effect of the progesterone, the estrogen, um, that's another complication. Another complication is the saturation. Um, another complication um, is uterine. Well, uterine ethylene will cause um, inability of the uterus to, to, to be able to contract, and she might be at risk of um, undergoing uh, hysterectomy. So I'd like to talk on the postpartum hemorrhage. Um, for the postpartum hemorrhage, so once this woman is coming, most likely she's going to be an elective case. So I want to ensure that I get experienced um, um, personnel as a surgeon, experienced anesthetist. I want to alert the um, massive transition, the hematology unit, that's the blood bank, to get at least a minimum of um, four units of blood ready. After I've confirmed, I've taken samples for full blood count, EU creatinine to ensure that um to know what the baseline um PCV is. So I would um, um for this woman, depending on the surgeon, I will want to do a um subarachnoid block for her. Uh, um so I went I have two white block annular. I want to possibility of doing an acute um emo acute hyperbolic emo so that when she's losing blood, she will lose less of um of red blood cells when she's losing blood. Now to ensure there are blood and blood products also available in case there's amount um, also have the blood available in the theater. So um 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 then once I notice that um, there is, um, she starts to bleed, I will ensure that um, the um, that time is available as much as possible. I want to ensure to do um, ensure that um, tourniquet is is applied and there is um, um, that time so that as much as possible they will reduce um, bleeding. So once there is once she starts to bleed, I want to ensure that I start to transfuse her. Then one of, another consideration is to ensure that there is um post op post operative ICU care in case she 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 we need to do massive mm -hmm. transfusion and she 
as a um, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well done, Doctor. Well done. More Is there anybody minutes. that wants to attempt? Yes. Another person to attempt for this question. She spends about five minutes. Yeah. Has another person that I want to attempt? I would like to um Marissa. add something, sir. Okay, go on. So um for the the part of the what are your concerns? She's yeah. also she multiple gestation. So she needs to also carry the neonatologist. We need to carry the neonatologist along because it's it's beyond the mother's life. And then okay. for the yes. um options, we can do subarachnoid block, epidural block, as well as combined spinal epidural, and then general anesthesia relaxation um, using rapid sequence induction. So those are options. Now, managing the complication of hemorrhage, we need to also talk about the use of oxytocins and um, antifibrinolytic agents, such as tranexamic acid, um, passage of um, arterial lines, be able to measure bit to bit um, blood pressure monitoring so that we can catch up as when due. And as much as possible, we can also put in a central venous line um, and then um, white ball IV access for um, massive transfusion. Part of the complications too may include hypothermia, which can also worsen the coagulopathy. This is from transfusing uh, multiple blood and blood, blood products that are still cold. So DIC post-op may also be a complication. The hematology unit must be involved in the management of this patient. Thank you, sir. Wait a minute. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sorry, sir. Want to should... okay. Yes, sir. I just want to add, sir. Okay. Sir, well, uh, then, related to the I'm Dr. Omar, sir. Dr. Omar Abdullah, sir. Okay. Yeah. Sir, um, for the A part, sir, addition is that as a pregnant patient, sir, the autocarbal compression also should be considered especially if the neuroaxial block is done. So I have to do um, uh, left lateral tilt to the patient so that to reduce the autocarbal compression on the patient. Then also I have to get ready with my emergency drug if I did the uh, neuroaxial drug. Then again, sir, as uh, the first presenter mentioned that I'm dealing with more than two live babies. So I will also consider the drugs uh, that can avoid that can cross I can avoid the drug that can cross the placenta and if uh, need arise that I must use them so an antidote for them has to be uh, available for example if I use the opiate I have to make sure that I have the um, naloxone because baby after delivery or after delivery of the baby they may have um, respiratory depression so I have to get ready with my naloxone and if I use the Benzodiazepine, I have to get my flumazenil by the side so that to prevent the uh, fetal um, um, cerebral complication of the cerebral palsy or cause of the cerebral palsy in the baby during the neonatal resuscitation. Then also, sir, the best choice of the anesthesia, sir, is either um, spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia or combined spinal epidural. But side the best is the epidural because in epidural I can do the surgery as well as I can manage the pain post of the in the patient. Unless if there is contraindication, then I will go for the um, spinal. And using the epidural also can prevent all that airway hyperresponsiveness because the patient is a non-asthmatic patient, even though she is stable, but uh, stimulation of the airway can affect airway hyperresponsiveness, which can, I can have us operating airway complication patient. Then um, also, sir, I will um, make sure that I have at least four units of blood so that it, to manage the post-operative uh, postpartum hemorrhage in the patient. Then sorry, sir, again, during the uh, pre-operation, sir, I can counsel the patient on possibility of hysterectomy because she is multi-grand multi 
Ara with multiple twin gestation. So she might be, she is at risk of postpartum hemorrhage, which probably part of the management may be emergency subtotal hysterectomy in bed. So I will have to make sure that I counsel the patient on that. Thank you, sir. Well done, Dr. Adwai and Dr. Jadwin. Yeah. You two of you have really covered, but just that, Dr. Jadwin, when you start, Sabi, Dr. Lanka, sorry. You somehow jumble everything together. Your presentation was not orderly. The way you attempt to answer the question. And then also, when in the second part of that, what are your anesthetic options? You mentioned first that what was number one on your list is the anesthesia. If that we should be considered as an option at all, should be the last. Because looking at your concern first, when you're looking at that, what are your concerns for this patient? Mm -hmm. One, I mean, I, I, among, among the concerns there that you're supposed to look at the patient, that is, she is a known asthmatic, though she has good control of the asthma. But at any point in time that you want to carry out any anesthesia for any patient that's asthmatic, if that procedure can be done, Without GA, that should be your preferred options, except there are absolute contraindications to other anesthetic options that you want to choose, which in this case you have three subarachnoid block, epidural anesthesia, or combined spinal epidural anesthesia. Your J anesthesia should be the last option that if the worst come, that the anesthetist. Is not successful in performing regional anesthesia that you might not consider general anesthesia for this patient that is asthmatic. And then now, uh, Dr. Abla mentioned that one of the concerns you should have for this gram multi, uh, multiparous woman that is a, 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 a with multiple gestation is the risk of hypoxia. They are very prone to when the line supine because of the large uterus that compress the, not cover that give the autocover compression that make them to be prone to hypoxia. So that's one great concern that your doctor have like mentioned that. Yeah, postpartum hemorrhage is also a concern from the uterine anatomy. A gram, a gram uh, multiparous woman, the uterine anatomy is on the, the risk is, is very high. So they are prone to have postpartum hemorrhage. Also, you know that, okay, we know the physiological changes that will cause physically in pregnancy, they have this physiological an anemia, which is more pronounced in multiple gestation. So dilution of hematopics, which you give physiological anemia, is supposed to be something that should be of concern to you. Yeah, you said that you group and cost match two to three units of blood ready in the bank. Also, as mentioned, you are dealing with more than one life. So availability of a neonatologist in the- uh, Dr. Olatumboson, you have two more minutes to round off. Yeah. Okay. In the, in the OR, is very, very important. The among the complications, most people are just mentioning postpartum postpartum hemorrhage. Now about preeclampsia, F syndrome. That's a common complication that you have with multiple gestation. So that should be thing that you should even look for. Then your in your as you are preparing the patient, you follow your investigation towards that. So then also multiple digestion come with something like a digestional diabetes. So you should rule out that. Check the for the blood glucose of the baby and also the, the mother intraoperatively. So that's all I have to clarify more on that question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, are there any other contribution that anybody would like to add, sir? Within one minute. Two, three minutes on this one question. Minute, one more minute, one more minute. I think we have um, one more question to be answered. And we have about 45 minutes now to go, to round up completely. OK. Okay. I think on this note, we can go for the 
The next question. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. The next question is this. Uh, so a 28 year old man admitted into intensive care unit following road traffic accident is being ventilated. Sorry, Dr. Ogunyomi. Professor yeah. Omar Sosa is up, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for recognizing me. I, I wonder, is uh, Dr. Alex Oham on this call? Um, I'm sorry, Ma. Um, Dr. Oham uh, was unable to join, Ma. Oh, they, okay. Okay. He was having, uh, he was unable to join at the time. Okay, no, because I saw when he came on, uh, he was made a co-host, so I didn't see him again. Okay, no, my, 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 yeah, okay, I've noticed he's no more around. I saw when he came on. Anyway, what my comment was to be for this uh, question on obstetric, but uh, since they commented on the time, I will wait till at the end of everything, I will, I'll make my comments there. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Prof. The next question is this, that a 28 year old man is admitted into intensive care unit following road traffic accident and is being ventilated. So it, was, it was noticed to become more comatose. Question you say, what could be the possible cause of the deepening unconsciousness in this patient. Then be part of question, you should describe your assessment and management of this patient. Let me come on over again. A 28 year old man admitted into intensive care units following road traffic accident. Is being ventilated. It was noticed to become more comatose. A, what could be the possible cause of deepening unconsciousness in this patient? B, describe your assessment and management of this patient. Do you have a question? So can Dr. Alazan Aliu, are you here? Dr. Alazan Aliu, if you are here, can you respond to the question? Okay. What about Dr. Anene? Dr. Anene. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm here. Okay. Hey, good evening. Can you respond to the question? Okay. Um, what are the 28 year old male admitted in ICU following ICU being ventilated for this piece to become more comatose? Oh, and what are the causes of deepening on consciousness in this patient? Then describe your assessment and management of the patient. Okay. Um. Okay. Um. Yeah. Are you there? Not yes, I'm, yes I'm, 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 here. I'm here. I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Um, yes, we have the floor. You can do that. You need to organize yourself. Within one minute to two minutes. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay. Um, for the for the fact the the unconsciousness is deepening, that means the the diagnosis be a diagnosis the right diagnosis is actually being missed here, or the patient is poorly managed. So I want to do a review of this patient. Um, review the history again, and then review the history again. Then possibly ask for more investigation. Okay, Did I want to find out. Uh, Dr. Adene. Yes, sir. I said, what are the causes of deepening unconsciousness? The patient has been ventilated. Yes, uh, yes. The patient okay. Okay. actually was, was diagnosed to be unconscious, maybe probably yes, due to traumatic brain injury. So they are asking you, then is level of consciousness able to be deepening? To be deepening, yeah. Yes, so what, what are the causes? What are the possible causes? What are the possible causes? The um, it was not misdiagnosed. Okay. It was, it was, it was right diagnosis. He has, he has traumatic brain injury. Injury, yes, sir. Then, oh, his okay. condition is becoming what? What, yes. are the, what, are the, what? what are the causes? Causes, yes. Um. Okay, so normally, uh, yes, in managing traumatic brain injury, we try to avoid this patient developing the secondary. I mean, second. Um, no, that's secondary. not what they're asking you. Maybe, sir. Oh, sir. Maybe, sir. Maybe, maybe, maybe I think we can call on another person. Okay, sir. Let me, let me see if I can attempt. Okay, this patient might have developed uh, something like ventilator associated pneumonia. Okay. Have you been on ventilator? The patient developed from the association. No, they didn't pneumonia. tell you how long has the patient been on the vent on ventilator now before you start talking about um what is noticed is that yeah. the patient conscious level is going down. As soon as yes. at the time that patient was admitted to ICU and side ventilating GCS was like 10 or 10 or 9. Now they assess again, you assess again, and now find out that the GCS has gone down to six. So what are the things that are likely to cost this? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. So um, in this patient, uh, something like increase in intracranial pressure. If there's increase in intracranial pressure, okay, that is not uh, being taken care of, it can lead to depending on consciousness. Then, if this patient is also not hypoventilated, if the patient is not um, is uh is hyperventilator. This can also uh, uh, sir, I think we can ask another person to attempt so because time is okay. going. Time is something on our side, sir. Hello, sir. Okay, hello, sir. Yeah, I would like to okay, sir. Okay, okay. Umar. Can I attempt? Dr. Umar. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Doctor, I'm not Umar. Okay, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yes, sir. Umar Black. Um, sir, <clears throat> the first question asks that um the patient is 28 year old who had a road traffic accident. And he was in ICU for ventilation. So the first question is to ask: uh, A part is to cause it was it noticed to become it was noticed to become more comatose. Hmm? Yes, sir. So now, yes, sir. what so the, could be the possible causes of the deepening unconsciousness? That's it. Then discuss sir, your assessment and management. Yes, sir. So the possible cause of the deepening of unconscious of the patient can be. Um, a bleeding intracranially in the, of the patient, or patient can be a uh, hypoxic or hypercapnic if he has problem with uh, ventilation. Then also fever, patient may be febrile can affect the conscious level of the patient. Then patient can also be hypoglycemic. Then also um, hypovolemia also can yes. cause with um, GCS. Then, um, um, if there is maybe uh, associated convulsion, also can affect the patient's uh, level of consciousness. So, side causes can be from the bleeding or hypoxia, hypercapnia, fever, glycemic control, especially hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, then hypovolemia, then also electrolyte disturbance in the patient. 
because if he has the patient has the uh, head injury, he may develop diabetic insipidus. He can be hypovolemic with uh, other electrolyte abnormality, especially sodium and potassium or magnesium in the patient. And also the drug patient, the cause of the RTA may be from the drug intoxication. So also drug can deepen his level of consciousness or the use of the drug interoperatively can also deepen his level of consciousness. So side are the causes for the low conscious level in the patient. Then for the B part of the question, sir, I would, um, based on my findings, I will start from um, the history of the road traffic accident that he it has the duration and the severity of the accident that the patient has. Then the other associated factor as convulsion, fever, last meal of the patient, whether the patient has uh, early attendance to the resuscitation or not. Then also what has been done to the patient in the emergency. Then from that, then I will go to examine the patient. So, so to assess his level of consciousness, I will do uh, Glasgow Coma scale of the patient since he's, uh, 20, he's an adult, 28 year uh, old, to assess and classify the level of consciousness, whether he's having mild, moderate, or severe level of consciousness. Then um, also I will um, examine the pupil to see whether there is asymmetry in the pupil so that to rule out uh, um, any uh, raised intracranial pressure of the patient and maybe affectation or unilateral affectation, which can be either from bleeding or other causes. And also cardiovascular system, I will take the patient's blood pressure and pulse rate to rule out uh, cushion reflex in the patient. Because if it has the raised intracranial pressure, it may have maybe hypertension with compensatory bradycardia. So I have to also look for that. And also the regularity of the patient's pulse rate so that to rule out arrhythmia which can be from that electrolyte derangement of the patient, which can further complicate the patient's uh, head, or, uh, patient uh, CNS abnormality. Then respiratory system also, I will look for the patient's saturation level, as well as the patient respiratory pattern that he has, whether there are other associated uh, injury in the chest. Then I will also look for the crepitations or any other sound in the respiration because the patient may have um, aspiration from that low level of consciousness of the patient. Then also, um, since the patient is on ventila uh, ventilator, um, so the airway reflex, um, the airway has been protected. So I will also look for that um, in the tracheal tube, uh, look on the ventilator to see whether there is raise in the pressure Maybe if there is obstruction of the endotracheal tube from secretion, kinking, or dislodgement of the endotracheal tube, I will also check for that. Then investigation, I will review the patient's investigation, the chest x-ray, the next x-ray. Sorry, if patient had neck x-ray or CT, I will also review it to see whether- no, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Umar. At this yes, doctor, um, we have to- Bring to an end to this uh, okay, sir. webinar session. Okay, sir. So I would like to thank our today's facilitator, Dr. Olatun Bosun Oguyomi from Zenit Medical and Kidney Center from our Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, for his um wonderful um, contribution and then um, over um, um, facilitation of the of the um, of the session so we really thank you very much for that thank sir you. thank you sir then at this junction I would like to invite the Madam President of this great association, the Nigeria Society of uh, Anesthetists. Madam, you have the floor. You're welcome, ma. Madam President, 
You have the floor, ma. Madam President is yet uh, to respond. On this, before then, I would like to call on Professor Waso. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Ma, I'm you have the floor, ma. Here. Uh, I'm very sorry, once, ma. Uh, well, if you want to call on Professor Waso, let her, let her talk, then I'll round off. Uh, okay, okay, ma. Okay, ma. Okay. Okay, ma. okay uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, Dr. Abdullah, um, thank you, the facilitator. I want to uh, greet uh, Madam President, especially, and stand on other established protocol. I will appreciate the participants and all the people that have answered the question. Please, my first comment is that the last speaker, uh, Honorable Moderator, you should have allowed him to finish what he had to say. The best yeah. thing to do is to say, uh, you have one minute or you have two minutes to round up. Then okay. the person will, uh, um, you know, kind of articulate himself better and uh, speak up and uh, round up. It is yes. not quite uh, polite to cut off uh, somebody like that mid mid speech and again this is a training um session it's not really the exam if it's exam you just say five minutes your time is up uh and that's it and then the person has to just keep, keep quiet but even in the exams some examiners may ask the candidate please uh, 30 seconds to round up or something like that. Okay, that's about that. Uh, what I, I wanted to comment earlier about the, um, the obstetric uh, question. I appreciate the people that answered it. Uh, it was well answered actually, but really the, the, the concerns in obstetrics were mentioned, but not, um, not tackled you know uh it is not acceptable to say you should carry the neonatologist along carry him to where to market what you mean to say is that the neonatologist should be in attendance at the cesarean section if it is a cesarean section uh even if it's a normal delivery the neonatologist has to be invited to the delivery uh, room and should be uh, part and parcel of the management to participate in the neonatal or to take charge of the neonatal resuscitation. Then the other thing, when they were talking about the concerns, and they mentioned that there will be postpartum hemorrhage because it's a multi and it's a multi uh, <clears throat> multiple pregnancy. But one, there was no definition of postpartum hemorrhage. Now, when you mention postpartum hemorrhage, please, please, please define it. You must define it. You must say it is a loss of more than 500 mils of blood within this specified time during the period, the peripartum period or during the time of delivery. So, uh, important define, definition is very important. Then when uh, the two or three people that talked about it, postpartum hemorrhage prevention is better than cure. Where you, the person chose, the doctor, I've forgotten her name, she chose to manage postpartum hemorrhage. When you manage postpartum hemorrhage, the management, the first part of the management is prevention. So you prevent it by active management of the, uh, as from the second stage of labor, active management is instituted, whether it's a vaginal delivery or it's a cesarean section, and then giving of oxytocin. When you say you will give oxytocin, please say uh, the name and the dose. If you're going to give uh, oxytocin, Say it. If you're going to give uh, a gometrine or a combination, whatever you're going to, or parbal, whatever you're going to give, say the drug 
and say the do's. Better still, say all the options and then choose one. And when the, any drug you mention, please say the dose and the route of administration. It's uh, always better that way. And then, then talk about the neonatal uh, resuscitation. Don't just mention that it will be done and you'll be uh, inviting the neonatologist. Uh, mention that if there is a need to do it, this and this and this, this is the, the, the consideration because of course we know that the one of the problems with a multiple gestation is that the babies may one or two of the babies may need to to be um, resuscitated um, resuscitated and then um, okay those those are the things I I, I noted I wanted to it's talk something. about uh, they they've been corrected on mm. the. Uh, the question on esophageal fistula, many corrections have been given. And then Dr. Gafar has kindly posted a write-up on the management of esophageal fistula. Um, I would like all, everybody to go through it. It's, it's quite a very good uh, write-up. Uh, the last question was a bit ambiguous for me. Um, I will classify it as not a very good question, uh, the way it was stated. But I think uh, the last person, um, Dr. Umar, I think, was doing justice to it before he was uh, stopped. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank the organizers and the panelists and the moderator and everybody that participated. I appreciate you. Thank you. Over Thank, you Thank, you Thank, you Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Prof. Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me, please? Yes, yes ma. ma. Good evening. Yes, ma. Okay. I want to indeed thank everyone for taking out time this evening to join us in this um, weekly act. Um, want to say that um, well all that has been said has been well taken by everyone and um, this is a learning ground for all of us and um, not only in academic but also in um, virtues you know in conversation so this has been stated clearly and um, we would want to continue to encourage that act that um, every one of us should uh, be um, built up in perfecting our skills Okay, so having said that, I want to um, call the PRO to please give us briefly some announcements, and then we round up this conversation. We usually don't want to stay for too long, not more than 90 minutes. So please, um, um, the PRO, um, okay, um, uh, we have our mommy here, our mama, Professor... Eniola Elegbe. Mama, good evening. You're welcome. Thank you for taking out time to be with us in this um, in this program. Um, we want to call you, Ma, to make some comments. Oh. Professor Elegbe, Ma, welcome. Yeah. Ma. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, ma. yes we can. Okay. Now, I think uh, we might want to improve on the system so that we can learn a little more. What I would suggest, do we have one more session or this is the last session? Um, on this um, we, particular uh, question and answers. We would have one more session now. You have one more session? Yes, next weekend. All right. What I would suggest is that um, when we throw the question out, to two people to answer. We look at the way and give them a, a, a specific um, timing. So we look at two approaches of candidates. And then we have uh, whoever is in charge, you call the coordinator or whatever. No, no, no. I don't know who, what to call the person, not the chairman, but the, the, the like rapporteur, somebody who, who has got a prepared answer. And then it runs through how that question is supposed to be answered. I think that we, we will learn a little more. 
we listen first to two people, look at the two different approaches, and then you look at what is supposed to be the ideal answer. And then we can now see what are the defects in the, the, the first and second approaches to the question. I think we'll probably gain a little more from what I have been um, listening to. Like, like some of the questions to me, this, the, the second part of it was not answered at all. I mean, it was not, to me, the way you answered it, I probably won't give any of you a pass mark. So, um, but then at the end of the day, what is the right answer? I don't think I've been able to get that out of the discussion. So I think somebody should prepare the right answer. And then uh, we, we, we get from the audience. Uh, what I mean is a consultant, you know, writing up that, the, the way uh, that, that question is supposed to be answered. Just a summary. I'm not saying that the, you should, they should uh, sort of babbling, uh, uh, follow him. So that's my suggestion. Well, it's a, it's a worthwhile exercise, I must say. Uh, Thank you very you much, Ma. Uh, it is well okay. taken. The, se the Secretary of the Education Committee is here and um, will pass it on to the Chairman for this to mm -hmm. be um, acted upon. It's a good one, Ma. We will act on it. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh -huh. Okay, Dr. Oshele, the NSAPRO, please um, a quick one, a quick one um, on your announcements. Thank you. Thank you, my Madam President. Uh, good evening once again, our trainers, our mentors, our senior colleagues and colleagues for being part of this eight webinar series, the second section for case-based discussions. Uh, here are the following announcements we have for us from NSA. Please, as you all know, that we need money to run this association. We want to plead with those who are yet to pay their NSA dues to kindly do so. And for those who have paid, we are saying thank you. And um, for our upcoming events, although I've, pasted, uh, I've posted the announcements on the chat box, we have um, our, annual and general, our annual general meeting and scientific conference coming up in Gombe starting from 27th of November to 1st of December. If you have not registered, please kindly do so. Then we have the World Conference of Anesthesiology coming up in Singapore in March 2024. And we're asked to do a, 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 a summary of what it will cost, which are posted on, the, on this chat box. Uh, generally, you will need about uh, $3,200 to $4,000 to physically attend this meeting in Singapore. Then for the All African um, Anesthesiology Conference, which is coming up in South Africa in September 2024. And so these are the announcements we have for us. Thank you and God bless you all. Yes. Thank you for that um, brief roundup. Um, want to appreciate you all and um, we pray that um, God will continue to keep us all in good health and continued impact positively in each other's lives. So on that note, I'll draw. Want to draw a curtain to this meeting. Please stay tuned. Um, stay connected to the platform, and uh, you hear information on the next subject for next week. Good night, everyone. We we, we still night. stay committed to you as your ex school. God bless you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night, ma. Good night. Thank you, ma. Good night. Good night. Yes, ma.